So we took a sample set of 8,000 companies that have received funding um, in the region. And we ran this algorithm and we found that 15% since the last time that we ran this, which was close to 12 months ago, have now shut down or have had an inactivity. Out of 8,000? Out of 8,000. Wow. So, yes, I do believe That's like, that yeah. many people aren't talking about the fact that there are a lot of companies that mm -hmm. are slowly either slowing down activity, not able to survive, and that is a challenge. Hi everyone, and welcome to Conversations with Lulu. My guest is Philip Pahoshi. He is the founder and CEO of Magnet, the region's leading VC data platform. Welcome, Philip. Welcome. Thank you very much for How having me. How have you me. been? Good, thank you. Good. Can't complain. Second time this year. Absolutely. Every six months. Yeah. I thought we'd kick off by maybe you giving us some update on Magnet. Like, I know you've expanded a lot recently. You're issuing a lot of reports. So maybe just give us, like, what's new in Magnet? Yeah, so for anyone who's not familiar, we're a venture capital data platform focused on what we coin as emerging venture markets. So effectively, anything outside of the US and Europe, we're a SaaS enterprise solution um, with now, I think, over 40,000 companies on the platform, uh, all the investment data, including valuations uh, and investor information. And the geographies that we now cover are Africa, the Middle East, and Southeast Asia. So I think the biggest complement to the data set has been including information around Singapore, which is now fully available on the platform. And we're now launching Indonesia, Malaysia, Vietnam. So it's an interesting supplement to benchmarking because one of the challenges that we always saw is that you look at the US and Europe, mm -hmm. they're very well-developed venture yes. ecosystems. So when clients are trying to find comparables, it's very difficult to compare to a New York-based fintech company or an agri-tech company in Houston. But can you find something in Singapore or in Indonesia or Pakistan and Turkey? So we're really trying to continue to focus on the emerging venture market space. Okay. And are there are there any parallels like so far uh, between a market like Singapore and Absolutely. So Dubai I, or Riyadh? I, I went to uh, Singapore back in April yeah. and had a wonderful roadshow around all of the VCs, government entities. And I think, look, there's differences and then there's a lot of similarities. Okay. Uh, in terms of similarities, the UAE and Singapore are very similar in construct. Uh, in fact, if you go over the last six months, I think it was one of either the FT or Bloomberg said that the UAE is becoming the Switzerland of the Middle East. And the other one was saying how Singapore is becoming the Switzerland of Southeast Asia. Okay. They're both becoming regional hubs to attract business, commerce, uh, investors, and capital. But then is, you look at the... Is it also like government-led and government-driven? Yeah, it's very government-driven. Okay. I mean, it's the same type of um, politics structure as the UAE to a certain extent. It's driven from the top down. It's very much trying to become a safe haven that can really support uh, the wider region. Okay. But then when you look at the demographics of the other geographies, you look at Indonesia, which is a massive population with a large GDP, which is basically where many of the startups want to scale into. In the same way oh. as many companies that are located here in the UAE, are all trying to go to Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. Historically, they were very keen on Egypt, but given the current economic environment, it's always a little bit more challenging. And then you start looking at the other geographies around uh, Southeast Asia, Taiwan, which is an up-and-coming tech hub. You look at the Philippines, Malaysia. Um, it's like looking at the MENA region. You start looking at the other GCC geographies and the Levant as opportunities. But one of the things I thought that was quite interesting is that when you look at an operating model, which is UAE Saudi or Singapore Indonesia, the opportunity really is to then bridge the, the markets together, uh, especially, especially when you look at Indonesia and um, uh, Saudi Arabia. Because when you look at Islamic finance, you look at Islamic travel, there's a massive Islamic population, which is in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. The companies are very applicable in both markets, what is true is that the disposable income in Saudi Arabia at a per capita level is much higher than that in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. But the size of the population in Indonesia means that you only need to be covering 10, 20, 30 percent of the market. And it's a much bigger market than the majority of the geographies yeah. that exist here in MENA. So I think that w one of the real takeaways for me was that um, there's that bridge that can be done. And if you want to be very strategic, 
albeit very complicated, you have India in the middle. And India is a massive market. And when you really look at the opportunities of bridging those three geographies, then you start looking at some very sizable scale. Okay. The challenge is that historically, not many people have explored that in both directions. In fact, I just give you one final like example. I was sitting with a VC, uh, one of the leading VCs in, in Singapore, and, and he was like, right, so show me this magnet platform. I said, look, why don't you look for um, a company in Africa or the Middle East that may be similar to a portfolio company of yours? And he said, fine, I'll challenge you. Can you find me a insect protein company mm -hmm. that is developing in MENA or Africa that we should explore? And I hesitated and I, <laughs> because I was like, that's like, how niche can you get insect protein? And when we did the search, we identified 15 companies across Africa and MENA, even here in the UAE and Saudi, that are creating insect protein, I think 75% of which had received funding. And he had never heard of the majority of them. That was the beauty of the opportunity is that actually there are many companies doing similar things that just haven't necessarily explored potential consolidation or funding. So I think that's a real opportunity right now. I think the challenge on the other side is that, and I'm sure we'll discuss this, a lot of VCs want to raise money and there's mm -hmm. a lot of international VCs that are coming to the region. Yes. The challenge though is that they realize that they need to deploy that here. here yes. and, and gone are the days where- Also they have the same terms. So. Well, no, as in they want to come here to raise, to go and invest in Southeast Asia. I get it, but Asia. they need to deploy here. Correct. They need to deploy here. Okay. And I met one of the largest sovereign wealth funds in Singapore because out of 10 VCs that I met, all of them said, we're coming to Dubai. I said, great. Are you investing in Dubai or the MENA region? Yeah. They said, no, no, no. We want to raise money to invest in Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. And I said, but you know what? I spoke to, and I specifically asked the question to the sovereign wealth fund in uh, Singapore and said, look, if a company was to raise in MENA, a MENA a VC was to come to you and say, we want to raise a fund yeah. to invest in MENA. Yeah. Would you give them capital? And they say, no, our mandate is to support the local ecosystem and investments locally. Yeah. And so the logic is, why would it be any different the other way around? Yes. So I think that that's a learning experience. And one of the things that I'm kind of expecting in the next couple of months with JITEX, with FII, et cetera, is that it's going to be this acceleration of investors coming back to the region. And that's a perfect opportunity for people to kind of discover what's happening here. That's very interesting, actually. It's, it's very interesting that you're looking at different markets outside of the region. I mean, how, how old is Magnet now? I think we're now at eight years. Eight years, yeah. yeah. So you started very local and then you're, you're yeah. providing all this data, which is great. So you recently released the, the H1 2023 report. So what stood out? I mean, we all know that the, you know, the environment is, uh, the funding environment is not that good. We know that VC funding has dropped. I was even looking globally at some numbers. I checked Deal Room. They have some numbers. So. Uh, global VC funding in 2021 was, uh, where is it, 766 billion, 2022 was 540, and so far it's 174 billion in 2023. So there is a decline in venture funding. I think it's the same here. So were there surprises? Well, I mean, it depends how you want to define a surprise. In okay. fact, uh, when we launched the H1 reports, I can say for the first time in a long time, I did a roadshow to meet many of our clients, which are government ministers, uh, ministries, and leading kind of uh, corporate institutions. And the reason I wanted to meet them was to kind of explain what was happening, because I didn't want them to think, oh, it's because Magnet's data is incomplete or that the information is wrong, but to actually explain, no, no, no there is a slowdown in venture capital activity because I think so many have been used to progressive years in the last two, three years of record year of venture investment, record year, it's double what it was last mm -hmm. year, that actually this year is remarkably one of the slowest venture uh, investment years that we've seen dating back to 2020, basically, 20, 2019. So your question of like, what kind of happened, shall I say, is that I start by explaining the macro environment. Mm -hmm. So to your point, if you take CB Insights report on global venture investment, it is the lowest quarter of venture investment for five progressive quarters. That's almost wow. a year plus. Okay. Um, here, we've seen that dating back into basically the peak was Q1 of last year, and then it started declining. And so 
number one takeaway is while we're seeing the lowest investment here in the region and before coming on the podcast and we're sitting now middle of September, we're seeing less than last quarter, albeit with two weeks to go. So I don't anticipate it to be more than effectively same as last quarter, um, is that it's very similar to what's happening globally. Mm -hmm. So what's happening in the region is not in isolation to the investment activity that's happening globally. Yeah. So at a very high level, while it's um, surprising or somewhat depressing on that side, the positive or silver lining is that actually it's not dissimilar to anywhere else. A lot of people were asking me or government officials were saying, why? Mm -hmm. I'm not claiming to be an economist, but like you can understand some of the underlying things. And I think the number one influence or factor that's really been driving it is interest rates. Um, David Sachs from the All In podcast, mm -hmm. Craft Ventures, uh, eloquently has repeated multiple times in the last couple of months that there is the venture crowding out effect. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I genuinely believe in that if interest rates, which are now at 5.5% in the US and likely to continue to go up to year end um, are at that rate, if you are a angel investor, if you are an institutional investor, which are the majority of LPs, whether you're the Harvard uh, Endowment Fund or a pension fund, you can go to a bank and get an interest rate of 5% with zero risk. Yes. If you look at corporate or treasury bonds, you can go up to six or 7%. That means the opportunity cost is that much higher. Even the stock market, which has seen record levels of like accelerated growth, uh, I think as of yesterday, it was about six or 16 or 17 percent on the S&P, more than 35 percent in the NASDAQ, means your expectation of venture returns have to be at a minimum close to 25 or 30 yes. percent annual compounded growth. <laughs> for it to be interesting to invest in the asset class yes. versus putting money into a safe haven. And I think that's one of the biggest drivers is that investors pull back, LPs are a little bit more sensitive and pull back. Everyone kind of slows down. That means valuations begin to go down, especially at late stage, far more aggressive at late stage than early stage. Mm -hmm. And as a result, Magnet that aggregates the investment landscape just sees that venture investment is slowing down. So when you put that into kind of the machine, it explains the logic and the, the slowdown that you're seeing in the environment from a macro level down into a micro level. And that is against the backdrop of interest rates are increasing to tamper inflation, higher cost of living, yeah. and the potential risks of a recession if that is to happen. So, so just to put it simply, just to reframe a little bit what you said in may, may, maybe more simple terms, is that if you want to invest, venture investing is very risky. There are many other avenues where you can invest and get basically a decent return without taking on all of the risk. And if you want to invest in venture, the minimum you'd expect is 25% on a yearly basis. However, um, so, so... And if you just flip that for the last two, three years, interest rates were at 0%. Yes. And therefore, the cost of investing or lending or et cetera was so low yes. and that there were no alternatives to invest in, people were investing in venture a lot more aggressively mm -hmm. than they are when it's at 6%. So that's the kind of flip from what were record years of funding towards a slowdown in funding. Okay, but it's interesting you mentioned the All In podcast because it's also one of my favorites. And and in one of uh, in one of their discussions, they spoke that there is a lot of dry powder, right, which is basically cash available for investment. Um, and and if you are a VC here in the region, I would imagine a lot of them have raised funds. I mean, there's there there were a lot of new VCs that came uh, over the past two to three years, correct? Well, so they had a good debate as to whether the numbers of dry powder were accurate because what was interesting was to say, if a fund says that they have a hundred million dollar fund, do they actually have a hundred million dollars in the bank? Has that been drawn down from yes. investors? And how much of that is actually available for deployment? Mm -hmm. And actually the numbers that are being thrown around of dry powder aren't necessarily investable dollars, but announced fund sizes mm -hmm. that are either looking to raise or 
have been announced to raise, but not drawn down by investors. I mean, generally, in some VCs, you can raise a hundred million dollar fund, but that is given to them in tranches of, say, 25 million over a period of time. Yeah, I get it. I mean, there's obviously they have to call capital and they have to get that money. So, yes, a fund that announced we uh, we have closed a hundred million dollar fund. Definitely, they'll be raising that money in tranches. But I think what I was trying to say is that a lot of funds were announced in this part of the world, right? So technically, the, the money has been dedicated to these to these funds. So why aren't we investing more? I mean, the, 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 the landscape is favorable to investors now. Um, people, the valuations are, are down. Uh, it is an investor's market. So I think like, there's two things. One, so why are the numbers there were, going there down, were no? funds that were announced in the last two, three years, many of whom did deploy a lot of capital in the last two, three years. So the question becomes, how much capital do they still have? Okay. In fact, this is one metric on Magnet that I've kind of challenged the team that we need to start capturing. I mean, we already mm. work in a very opaque environment. So getting funding, yeah. and valuations, but now one of the most, every time you bring out a new feature, everyone wants a new feature and returns of funds and actually dry powder is one of the biggest challenges that we're currently looking to try and tackle mm. to year end. The second thing is, Actually, to be clear, what you have seen is that at an aggregate level, there has been uh, a slowdown in, in funding. But actually, you have to also look at it stages. So where valuations have dropped off, the, the one stage that has stayed somewhat constant is actually at early stage. Mm -hmm. So that what that valuation of like a million, two million dollars? The million dollar raise at about five, like whatever it is that it's at. The, the early stage investment okay. has remained relatively um, uh, con con constant. And the reason being that early stage investments are a lot less riskier long term, given that companies take up to eight years to exit, mm. than it is for late stage. So the biggest impacted stage of investment is late stage investments, mm -hmm. which I was looking in the car coming here, valuations are almost 30% lower mm -hmm. in six months than they were at the end of last year. And hence the phenomena that many people are talking about, down rounds and companies having to raise at lower valuations than previous investment rounds. But when you look at the data, you're talking about aggregated data. So you can have double the amount of early stage investments, mm. but one mega deal in Floured or Nana of 100, 150 million skews the numbers so much yeah. that when that's not happening, and in fact, not surprising, but of note, Q2 and Q3 were the two quarters we have not seen a mega deal this in year? the region this year, okay. dating back to almost 2019. So a mega deal is $100 million, $100 million plus. Million plus. Uh, funds raised. So, so the reality is that the late stage investment landscape has definitely dropped off. Not to say that investors aren't investing. I mean, we've seen close to $180 million invested last quarter across 70 deals. So there are deals that are happening, but they're happening at much earlier stage. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm not an investor. I speak to many investors who look at the opportunities at early stage. Um, and what they say is if companies have a strong founding team, a product market fit. And in this environment, more than ever before, strong unit economics, then they are getting investment. And I think that the days of uh, scale at all costs have slowly gone away. Mm -hmm. And many companies are having to also just rebalance their, 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 their books. And so another point is that fundraising is demand and supply many founders may choose not to want to have to raise in this environment because valuations are mm. coming down. And therefore, a lot of them are being cost conscious. And, and again, the old and pog guys were giving lots of recommendations nearly nine months ago that you need to extend your runway, you yes. need to make sure that your burn isn't going to kill your business, you have to slash costs to be able to achieve that. So there's, there's two sides of that marketplace. Startups may not be wanting to raise and conserve cash until they begin to see a pickup again so that their valuations are not hurt. Effectively, the down round concept, where if you raised for the sake of argument at a valuation of $100 million, your cash has run out, you need to do another round, but it's at a lower one. The investors have not necessarily made much of a benefit from the last round, so it's easier not to raise. 
One thing that's very difficult to capture from our perspective are bridge rounds. So not to say these two, three million dollar bridge rounds to get you through the next couple of months aren't taking place, generally of oh, which so these aren't are not captured. shared. They are wherever we can capture them, okay. but publicly they don't get shared. Investors don't like to announce that. They tend to be existing investors who take secondaries or additional capital into the cap table as part of those rounds but they're not big investment rounds that we've been so used to over the last two year, mm. three years. So I genuinely think it's a double-sided marketplace whereby uh, startups are generally being a lot more cautious at earlier stage, taking slightly bigger risk, and the availability of capital, specifically at late stage, is a lot less available. And to continue down that path, specifically driven by the fact that international investors were the biggest investors at late stage, and we're talking Series B, Series C, and et cetera. We've seen the lowest participation of international investors yeah. this year. It was year. 50%. Uh, no, uh, that's the total number of VC investors have dropped uh, by 50%. Correct. And it's uh, the lowest percentage from international. I just looked in the car at 27% this year, which is the lowest participation dating back to 2019. And actually, one myth that... Uh, and this is a different discussion point, but one government official is saying that we've never seen as many international investors coming to the region than ever before. Um, aren't we seeing more capital? And I said, with respect, the capital that's deployed is at 10%, i.e. international investors for what is a low year of investment have accounted for only 10% of all the capital. Not to say that they may meaning, not be invested. Meaning, wait, can you clarify that? Let so if you it. take the total amount of investment, which is- Was uh, that an international VC will deploy? No, that was invested in MENA-based companies okay. this year. Yes. Only 10% of that came from investors that are headquartered from outside of the okay, region. Okay, got you. Whereas okay. historically, specifically driven by late-stage investments, that could have accounted of close to 40 to 50% oh, wow. of the invested okay. capital. So you've seen the lowest participation by number of investors that are coming from outside of the region okay. and the lowest deployment of capital coming from investors outside of the region. And that is predominantly because late stage investments have kind of fallen off cliff. Yeah, so so international uh, VCs are like in triage mode. They're helping their own portfolio companies, trying to figure out. Exactly, uh, I mean, it goes back to the point that this is a global phenomenon that's yeah. taking place and everyone's focusing on their home markets as yeah. opposed to trying to kind of explore what was and it goes back to what we said that so we zero, were like the, the the cherry on top this uh, this market basically not necessarily i mean not people the, were excited about this market and i do believe that there were huge opportunities but in a zero interest rate environment where the cost of capital is so low and you can get more from investors and the appetite to invest was a lot higher exploring new markets was a lot less costlier than when interest rates are at 5.5, 6% five, 5 um, and, and making people become a lot more cautious. And given that startups aren't necessarily raising at the rate that they used to, they focus on their portfolio companies and mm -hmm. making sure that they're in order. One of the uh, general partners at a VC here, Sukuna Ventures, Asher, he mentioned something um, about basically, you know, that, that kind of cheap cost of borrowing led to uh, like an explosion and in inexperienced VCs that came in and drove the valuations higher and all of that stuff. What do you what do you think about that? I mean, do you think it's actually the case in our part of the world? I mean, uh, again, I, I, each VC is different. They have their uh, mandate. They have their experience. I think that if put it like this, how many VCs in the region have a track record of more than 10 years, an economic cycle? In fact, one of the things that you could hear in the All In pod is they talk about VCs, established VCs in the US have been through economic crises, yes. whether it's 2008, whether it's 2001. And in fact, so many of the VCs here in the region have been set up within the last five years, which has literally been uh, a, a, a cycle of just boom mm -hmm. in terms of venture capital. So I'm not here to necessarily speak about the behavior of the VCs, but you can speak to the track records and the experience of um, the region relative to other regions. And I do think that in the last two, three years, there has been a FOMO effect of valuations being driven up, not necessarily by VCs. In mm -hmm. fact, if you were to go to Saudi Arabia, a lot of people would be talking about how angel investors or family offices that haven't necessarily had the experience in venture capital have been accepting the valuations being somewhat mm. um, ridiculous because they wanted to get into the game. And traditional VCs, and you can speak to some that have been around for the eight, nine, 10 years here in the region, mm -hmm. 
passed on many deals because they felt that the valuations didn't make sense. The challenge is the traditional VC, as we were talking about when you mentioned dry powder, the availability of capital to invest in companies that they have raised, um, is usually around a mandate and they are required to invest that within a time period. Yes. And therefore they don't necessarily have the luxury of waiting many, many years for the perfect deal. And so if valuations and those VCs that you mentioned had raised funds, which is why people talk about vintages and why the last two years up until the slowdown in investments uh, were some of the worst vintages or grouping of investments that they've made given such high valuations, um, that's part of the fact is that they need to deploy that capital. And in fact, if you're raising a VC fund mm -hmm. now, given that valuations have come down so much, you are likely to see, as they say in the US, some of the best startups are born out of economic crises or, or, or venture slowdown because the behavior of the founders have completely changed and become much more attuned to cost and unit economics. So I can't speak to the specific behavior of GPs uh, in the region, but you can speak to the overarching experience of the region versus other geographies. Okay, so by vintage, again, just to clarify, vintage is the year a fund was announced. Yeah, and uh, well, when the investment, exactly, the year the fund was announced and when the investments were made. If these funds have been announced, money is available, maybe not in their, their bank accounts, but they can draw that money. Why isn't more investment happening? Given, again, that it's a... It's a good environment. I mean, well, you have to define a good environment. Is it a good environment for I mean, investing? Well, assuming that the company is doing well. So let's not forget that many companies may mm. not be doing well. I mentioned the point that it was growth at all costs. The concept of venture is that you can predict or look to make another round of investment 12 to 18 months after your last round. Mm -hmm. And therefore, profitability was never considered. It's scale at any cost. Yes. Raise the next round, raise the next round, exit It's good IPO. for VCs though as well, absolutely. right? They want that also. No, no, but absolutely. Yeah. But then your question is, why aren't they investing? Mm -hmm. Is because many of those companies either no longer exist, are in financial challenged environments, or are not accepting investments because it's a down round in terms of valuations compared to what it would have been 12 to 18 months ago. Mm. So it's that double side that I was talking about. And if you are, we're talking, what are investors? You have angel investors. We talked about interest rates and the stock market and mm. deposits and, and the ability to invest there. Why go into something that's super risky? Yeah. You look at the VC LPGP model, well, Many of them may have deployed a lot of their capital in the boom years of 2001 and 2002 and run out of capital and LPs aren't necessarily interested, which is why the government support of your fund of funds, your DFDF, your ADQ, your Jeddah and SVC, which is really driving the investment activity that's happening in Saudi and the UAE mm -hmm. versus other MENA geographies where there's a lot more challenges, um, either are looking to raise themselves or they've already deployed their capital and they're focusing on their portfolio companies. Because mm -hmm. again, we go back to the point of the companies are challenged, let them make sure that their portfolios are doing well before they invest in others. Yeah. You go to CVCs, you've seen the like of corporate SDV, venture capital corporate funds. venture capital funds. You look at EAN Capital, which is really making waves into, that's patient capital. They're, they're investing off balance sheet. So yes. they don't have that requirement for that capital to be deployed within specific time periods. And they return funds to their limited partners. Exactly. Their they don't have to do that. Yeah. And then you have the international VCs, which have really been driving late stage investment in the region. And they're all focused on their home markets. Yeah. So, and the flip side of that is if valuations are going down, they are likely to only go down further in the next six to 12 months. So it's a patient game of, well, if they're struggling and they're trying to, you might wait six months and it'll be even cheaper to invest in than mm. it is now. So there's, there's it, it, it's not easy to say, why aren't they investing from kind of a, a simplistic view of, there's capital they should be deploying. It is really a demand and supply on both sides. And you might have an investor that wants to invest and the founder doesn't want to, or there's a founder that really wants to raise, but the investor doesn't have the capital to deploy. So it's it's very difficult in this environment. Is it though a bit too hawkish in terms of behavior on the part of VCs? Like, I mean, I know a lot of companies that are trying to raise at the moment and they are struggling. Yeah. Uh, some really great companies with great founders. Uh, 
they raised obviously in different times two years ago and they're trying to raise now and it's very difficult. And sometimes I don't understand the, the reaction of, of VCs. I mean, if it was two years ago, that same company with those same metrics, with the same people, you would have probably invested at three times the valuation that you want to invest in today. Yep. So I'm also seeing this kind of behavior. Uh, I don't know how, how prevalent it is. Maybe you might know more. I mean, uh, but I, 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 just, I just worry, you know, it makes me worry about entrepreneurship like in this part of the world, because when you and I started companies, right, back in 2012, 11. 15, uh, 16. <laughs> uh, okay, well, I started earlier. Um, there was this huge drive to build the entrepreneurship ecosystem in the region, right? I mean, there yeah. were no entrepreneurs, there were no accelerators, incubators, there were a handful of VCs. Uh, so, so we've done all of that, yeah. you know, and you've seen all that growth. And then what are we doing now? I just feel like, are we, are we just killing our ecosystem? So I think there's two questions there. The first question, is it hawkish? Yes. Again, it's very individualistic. You can't force investors to invest if they don't want to invest. And mm. that IRR calculation, that internal rate of return with interest rates at 5.5% means that everything is far more expensive than it was but two again, three but, years but ago. But I'm not debating that though, Philip, because... because so, so this IRR becomes an issue when an LP, when an LP, when an, basically someone who's investing in a VC fund says, I don't want to give you the money to VC. I'm going to put my money in uh, whatever, uh, treasury, estate. US treasury bills or something or whatever, real estate. But in the case where the funds have been announced and the funds basically have been allocated to venture, right? So... Again, maybe the founders don't want to accept low valuations. They, they have the, if you have the cash, you can demand lower valuations. The founders might not want to. Mm. Desperate companies may not be in a position that the startups, that's what I mean. It's very individualistic by mm -hmm. case. Uh, and so I don't think that it's a hawkish sentiment in general. The other point is that if they give them money, do they believe that they can raise another round in 12 months? Mm -hmm. And if they don't believe the company can raise another round in 12 to 18 months, they pull back. So, so we're going to see fatalities, like lots of fatalities. I think so. I, I'll give you an interesting stat. Um, we ran an exercise for our database where we run an algorithm to know how many active and inactive startups there were. So we took a sample set of 8,000 companies that have received funding um, in the region. And we ran this algorithm and we found that 15% since the last time that we ran this, which was close to 12 months ago, have now shut down or have had an inactivity. Out of 8,000. Out of 8,000. Wow. So yes, I do believe That's like, that yeah. many people aren't talking about the fact that there are a lot of companies that mm -hmm. are slowly either slowing down activity, not able to survive, and that is a challenge. And that goes to the second part of your question. For all the hard work that has been put into the ecosystem, we talk about cycles again, and this is the bottom of what has been an eight-year cycle. We talk about the celebration of entrepreneurship that took yes. place here in the UAE. I don't yes. know if you were there. Of course. In 2013, that was 2010. the catalyst. It was 2010. Yes. That was the catalyst to what became Wanda's platform, the yeah. IMF's investment, the drive of innovation. That is basically a close to 10-year cycle now um, from when that kind of came to fruition Things are in cycles and mm. we are now at a slowdown. The challenge becomes from a government perspective, is venture investment still something that they would like to focus on? The private sector will continue to focus on it. Mm. As we've seen historically, venture will come back. And when we talk about industries, there'll be a change of industries, there'll be a change of technology. We know that technology has really kind of changed the economies and people's behaviors. So from a positive perspective, that's not going away. The question is, who are the companies that are able to disrupt that? And so the challenge is, how do you maintain the interest into a sector that has spent only eight, nine years developing so that that hasn't been lost on founders, the market, the investors, and the success stories that will really drive new interest into this market? And that is a question I'm more worried about. Yeah. Now, we continue to see government initiatives around this. Um, you see in Saudi Arabia, a big push from the government with regards to unicorn projects for 2030, Vision 2030. Here in the UAE, you've seen efforts from the DIFC, um, you see ADQ, you see many of those initiatives. But it is at the grassroots to drive innovation. It is talent, it's access to markets, it's 
technology development, those things need to continue. And at the cost of living and the increasing cost that we're seeing, that becomes a lot more challenging for companies or founders to want to jump and take that risk. Not to say that if we have this conversation in five years time, it wouldn't have swung back yes, and everything's going positive. Again, if we talk about interest rates, if in 2024 they begin to go down again, yes. then people will start coming back into the market. Yeah. You've already seen, that if you look at what's happening in the stock market, what drove the six months of growth in the last month, uh, in, in the first half of the year? It was driven by the AI boom off the back of what was a collapse of many of the tech stocks last year as interest rates were going up. AI and the adoption of AI and the AI story really accelerated the market, which was driven 75%, if you take, for instance, the S&P, was literally 75% were seven tech companies that drove the rally that you saw in the first six months of the year. So if interest rates go down again, then maybe we mm -hmm. see a return of that venture investment activity. So, but in the short term, not even medium term, you do need to see continued focus and effort from government to support what is a very fragile market. So that it doesn't have to restart again from scratch. Absolutely. I mean, I worry about existing entrepreneurs. And, and as you mentioned, I also worry about like the the willingness for people to to make that leap and uh, and start a company given the given this current environment. So let's talk a little bit about industries because um, uh, we know that like it's the same basically three industries that have been getting the lion's share of funding here in the region: fintech, yeah. transport, logistics, and e-commerce. E so. I see from the recent report, this hasn't changed. No, even yeah, the only thing that's changed- like It went down. The only thing that's changed is FinTech has really just dominated the market. Um, I think if you took FinTech um, investments by number of transactions, it's the same number of transactions as the next three industries combined. So mm. clearly there is a flight towards the disruption of the financial services. Logically so, because it is one of the largest markets. It is the most attractive for international acquirers or investors um, to disrupt that market here in the region. I think that in any emerging market, e-commerce and logistics tends to be the first industry to get disrupted. So in fact, what you're seeing now is a lot of consolidation in that space rather than investment to new products. Mm -hmm. Whereas fintech as an industry and a sector uh, remains ripe for disruption and not many dominant players in the same way as you see in uh, logistics and e-commerce. So I think that's the case. This AI boom, I'm personally challenged with because we get this question all the time. Mm -hmm. It's a bit like deep tech, which many governments are focused on. They're not industries, they're labels. So AI is a feature for many companies. There's very few AI tech companies, okay, ChatGPT, BARD, etc. But the reality is many companies are adopting it's an artificial intelligence. In so you can be a, um, a fintech company or a health tech company that has a, an a, a artificial intelligence feature to it, but are you an AI company or are you a, a health tech company that has incorporated artificial intelligence mm -hmm. to make your company better? So where people talk about artificial intelligence, and I say this purely from a database perspective, mm -hmm. can you tell us all the AI startups? It's like, well, I don't know that they are AI startups. There are startups in particular sectors that have adopted AI technology, but yeah. it's a, it's almost like a feature of the product. Same as deep tech, which people talk about. How, how do you define what deep tech is? Because everyone's definition, and we have this because we have many clients that want to do a sponsored report on deep tech. One of the challenges is your definition of deep tech, my definition and their definition could be three completely definitions of what companies are doing within what's, the deep what's tech What's the consensus space. Uh, definition of deep uh, tech? There isn't one, but uh -huh. each one considers that it could be completely completely different. Um, and, and so in the end, the sector that sees the most investment is a very identifiable financial services ripe for disruption. And even within that, it's point to point. So when you look at transfer and logistics, Kareem, you look at Souk, it's ultimately pick up, drop off of a good, a person, a product. In financial services, while the crypto boom and bust and all of those type of blockchain concepts have come and gone, the ultimate 
companies that have received the most investment is money point-to-point -point transfer of funds. So payment gateways and, and platforms that allow for remittances. Buy now, pay later, which has seen its own challenges with regards to margins and ability to, to make money from the platform have received a lot of investment from that type of landscape. And I don't see that necessarily being disrupted hugely in the next six to 12 months. You have seen other industries of interest, specifically here in the GCC, food reliance. So mm -hmm. technology that's trying to support uh, food development, food sustainability. You have seen a drive towards healthcare and education because of the large opportunities, specifically when we talk about Indonesia and uh, um, Saudi Arabia, when you look at Islamic education, even cartoons and, and content. Content, I think, is an area that will continue to grow um, in terms of entertainment and the opportunities that exist in that space. But the amount of capital that's being deployed is also you need to backward engineer it. In financial services and in transport and logistics and e-commerce, there are identifiable acquirers of those companies, mm -hmm. if not IPOs, but that's a whole different subject with regards to the ability to IPO um, those type of companies here in the region. But you can identify potential yeah. acquirers. When you get into slightly more niche spaces of health tech and education tech and food reliability, et cetera, the amount of acquirers in that space is a lot thinner that have appetite for the region. Yeah. And therefore, as a result, investor appetite in those industries is challenged. Yeah. And so it's kind of, it's, it's all a loop uh, with regards to uh, the industry and its development. But that was fintech, always, yeah, that, it's always been like that. Yeah, that was, I mean, that has always been a challenge, right? I mean, anytime you try to build something in an industry that's slightly, niche or or not kind of mainstream, you would face that challenge of finding investors willing to put money in that. You speak to Magnus and, and, and Modessa, and, and one of the core values of when they started Kareem is they wanted to disrupt an industry that was huge. And mm -hmm. I think sometimes when you're founders, and it's my biggest learning lesson doing a venture data platform in emerging markets, is that you when you want to disrupt something, it has to be pretty big yeah. if you want it to be huge. Otherwise, the more niche it is, the much harder it is for, the, for it to get to scale. Yeah, well, they did have Uber as a as a comparable. Yeah, but they had it, proven it, Uber, basically Uber a successful. Uber only really started two to three years before Kareem yeah, did, so yeah, it, it was an example. But it wasn't like Uber is what it is today. Mm. When they they started in two thousand thirteen, and Uber started, I think, correctly if I'm wrong, around two thousand eleven or two thousand ten. So yes, it was around. And what they had originally started as Kareem was not what it became as yes. well. So at least the pivoting, yes, they may have moved into something they had mm. never intended it to be a B two. C platform. It was originally a B two B solution. I posted yesterday on LinkedIn. I said I'm going to be interviewing you. What What should I ask you? And uh, Talal Tabba, you know Talal, the, yeah. the founder of Coinmina, he said, "What's the What's the most kind of hyped up sector uh, that you see for 2023 so far? Is there like a hype somewhere? Is Is everybody so it's fintech? I mean, ultimately, I don't know that there's a hype. I mean, fintech in its numbers and as an industry, I still think is a firm industry that is ripe for disruption. Mm -hmm. Again, you need to go into the subsectors. I, I I think for the amount of capital that's being deployed, I don't think that there is a hype. I mean, you could talk about AI mm -hmm. is a hype sector, but as I said, it's a feature. So it's not really like it's a hype sector as such. Um, definitely the crypto and the blockchain boom of the last two years is a perfect example of an industry that was kind of uh, hyped up to a certain extent. I'm sure there are very strong fundamentals for some of them, but the way that you've seen the stories of FTX and many others have kind of shown how venture in that space can be very challenging. Um, but I don't know that in this year where capital is so scarce that there is a particular hyped up sector. In fact, mm. I think anyone who's getting capital must have strong fundamentals, otherwise they wouldn't be able to raise in this type of market. So you know Walter Isaacson, the famous, the famous biographer, he's written a book about Steve Jobs, there it is. He's okay. written a book about Einstein um, and, and, and a few other great um, leaders. And he's written a book about Elon Musk. They were talking about it this morning uh, on a podcast. Um, so Walter Isaacson wa was talking to Lex Friedman. Um, and basically he said that when Elon Musk went into Twitter, um, the whole kind of mental health was like such a big thing, work from home. They had yoga studios at Twitter and so on. And he basically went in and he just wanted to make it hardcore. And th these are the words that Walter Isaacson used. Uh, and, and, uh, and that's why obviously he did all of these layoffs and, and basically he asked people, he told them, I mean, you're either going to be hardcore and, and, and build this thing or you can go, you can leave. And a lot of people left as well by their own will. So, 
given the, I was, it made me think like given the current environment, um, like how important is it to be uh, hardcore? I mean, is there like, b because there was, a, there was some time when we were talking about, you know, mental health and like work-life balance and, and how founders uh, are like really depressed and stuff like that. So it kind of made me think, um, is there, is there a place for balance and entrepreneurship, especially now? Yeah, well, there's two different things. There's the mental health of founders and employees, and then there's kind of um, work-life balance and, and the work-hard mentality. I look each founder to their own, and everyone talks about the importance of culture and the team and, and, and the way that you drive kind of performance within um, uh, an organization, high performance, as many of the kind of podcasts refer to. There is a certain extent that when people were working from home and the, the whole COVID pandemic has really created an environment where um, people had a different work ethic and environment to ones that existed maybe 10 to 20 years ago. And I think that when cost comes into question, and I think a lot of what Twitter was trying to drive was it was a bloated workforce that, that didn't necessarily make sense. And in fact, if you look at all the tech companies, even here in the region, which had many cuts in jobs, a lot of the reasoning around that is because that there were a lot of people bloated in terms of employment to get two to three people to do the same type of job. So it really does come down to, and then again, we talk about the boom of venture capital of the last two, three years. People were hiring like crazy to do just anything because they had the capital that was available to hire. So there wasn't the same shrewd mentality. So I think that when that reverses and you become very cost conscious and you need to try and get as much as you can and to extend your runway, naturally compared to an environment where you had a lot more cash availability, people have become a lot more focused on being able to maximize the resources that they have available to them. The challenge becomes is that you still want to create not a toxic environment, but a healthy environment that people are able to thrive in. Mm. And I think it's a very important debate to have. Um, but again, it's very challenged and it's based at least to a certain extent on your availability of cash, which can be very difficult. Yeah. I just always thought that, you know, Startups are not really for everyone. Working for a startup no, is not for everyone. Not. And it's just so hard. I mean, you talk about mental health. What, what have we gone through in the last three to four years? I mean, we went through COVID where everyone's sitting at home. As yeah. a founder, you're trying to survive, the which we've almost forgotten what it was like for the first six months where everyone was at home. Half the companies were unable to yeah. operate. Many companies thought they were going to go bust. Companies like Kareem, by Absolutely. the way, I spoke to Mudassar. Which, which exited two months or a month before yeah. that deal. Had that deal been done six months later, it would have been a completely different deal deal to the one that was done uh, literally two months before that hit. And then you, you then you have the challenge of trying to get everyone back to the office and, and the challenges that comes with people not wanting to come back and that, then coming back. Then you get venture investment and everyone's completely obsessed with aggressive growth. And now you're going through an economic environment where everyone's trying to be a little bit more cost conscious and, and really like get your run with it, 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 you are just continually being faced with challenges. That's no different to any normal company. But I think in a startup space where people are much smaller, limited experience, you're not large institutions, you can't fall back on um, years of history for large corporate and MNC type behavior with, with board of directors, with huge experience and, and banks that will lend to you, all of those features that kind of like more traditional businesses are able to do that's where mental health really does come in. And I think one point is that like for the founders that have been doing this for eight, 10, 12 years, there has been a fatigue. I think when we talk about the challenge in the region is that some founders have been doing things in the region for eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 years. Um, and at some point there's just fatigue and you're going through another crisis and another crisis and you're raising and that's what is difficult from a mental health perspective here in the region. Whereas in the US, there's a lot more transparency towards these type of things. There's also a lot more availability to capital and exits and, and different opportunities. But I think here, uh, it's something that not many people necessarily even acknowledge or empathize with in a way that maybe in more developed markets, uh, it's a bit more mainspread. I just think we need to decide what we want like in this part of the world, because I feel that we, we follow trends um, and, and, and especially like on the investor side, I feel like we follow trends when it's suitable. Like when it was growth at all costs, like we, you weren't seeing a lot of investment here in the Middle East, for example, to match, uh, like 
all of the other, uh, let's say, U.S. or, or high-growth markets. And then now, you know, it's um, it's everybody's about profitability and, and 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 so on. So I just feel that sometimes we just follow trends. But, but you know what? There's a challenge in your question. What is this part of the world? You can speak to a government official and a founder in Saudi, and it'll be completely different to Egypt, which will be completely different to Lebanon, mm. which will be completely different to Kuwait. And I think herein lies one of the biggest challenges of this part of the world is that it's not the United States of America. It is not China. It is not India from a market size perspective. There isn't kind of a common approach to doing things. You could speak to a founder, government official and investor in any of those geographies and they will have very different approaches. There'll be a general kind of sense uh, and herd mentality to them, but they'll be very different across all of those geographies, which makes the challenge and the opportunity of the region. So what do you what do you think is going to happen next? I mean, this year is nearly over, right? Yeah. We still have one quarter. Yeah, I mean, we brought out a prediction report for this year because uh, when I was doing that roadshow that I mentioned, every government official was saying, well, how are we going to end the year? Mm -hmm. And so we, we took six different scenarios. We applied the year of COVID, which had a very similar trajectory. Mm -hmm. we, we looked at a doubling. We looked at some algorithm to show us every prediction shows basically that this year is going to be uh, less funding than last year, which isn't too much rocket science. But the main reason for that is late stage investment. Mm. If you do not have the mega deal investments that we saw in the previous years, there's no way you're going to see that flurry of investment activity okay. that you've seen historically. I think that Q4 will be very telling. It'll be a litmus test as to how 2024 will pan out. And a big catalyst to that will be the interest rate environment and the economic environment. In fact, if you to speak to my pessimistic side, I still don't know that we have seen the toll of interest rates on the wider economy to come into fruition. And whether that is real estate prices, whether that is wage inflation, whether that is other economic impacts that we saw in 2008, not to say that we're going to see a, another subprime, mm. but if we weather that storm, and many people talk to the fact that there isn't going to be a recession in the US or at least globally, then the question becomes, when do we start seeing appetite come back? And mm. that's likely when interest rates go down. So this year, Q4 will be a litmus test because what we have seen in the region which is very particular to this region. And we brought out as part of that, this seasonality trend. So to put things into context, Q2 was 80% lower in funding compared to Q1. And as of coming here, Q3 was 10% lower than Q2, where historically Q3 has always been 35% lower because than of Q2 the summer. because of the summer. Yeah. However, we had the Eid and the Ramadan and two holidays all in Q2 and then the summer. So you've almost had that double impact of the summer seasonality. Historically, Q4 has always been an uplift of close to 40, 50 percent from Q3. You also have events coming up. So is all of this talk of international investors coming to the region actually going to translate into investments? I spoke to an investor yesterday from the region. He says, I'm aware of one or two mega deals that are coming into fruition from international investors. How much of that is attracted by government? How much of that is fundamental investment? We talk about the opportunities that we said about Singapore and more people traveling to Singapore and vice versa. There are conferences that are taking place in Southeast Asia. There's more people coming here. I do think that the interest from the US and Europe may have tampered off and that there's more opportunities uh, east-west across Asia. But in terms of predictions, clearly investment capital okay. is going to be lower this year than last year. What else? I think that next year, the M&A activity that has been very slow in happening, which was a prediction I started the year by saying that this year would be a record year of M&A. One thing I didn't take into effect was all of these factors then make it even harder for acquisitions to happen. Because in reality, founders are a lot more emotive. Investors have to take much bigger risks in acquiring companies in cash when a safe haven can allow them to get through the next six months. But I do think that as that begins to soften, you will begin to see more and more consolidation going into 2024. I think that Saudi Arabia and the UAE will 
continue to become the standout geographies in terms of invested capital. SVC alone has made investments as an LP. We talk about the dry powder availability into the likes of multiple funds in Saudi Arabia. And there's a concerted effort. And we talk about the ecosystem development focus. I, I really do see that in Saudi, with all of the uh, activity that's happening, you will begin to see these larger companies raise funds and continue to scale um, from a geographical perspective. And I do think that valuations will continue to slow down into 2024 and that it won't be until the second half of 2024 when real investment activity will begin to pick up. And for entrepreneurs? Tough times. Ex and existing and new entrepreneurs. I think it's, I, so I went back to the point that early stage startups are likely to begin to receive more and more investment easier than later stage and more okay. established companies. Because again, you're coming in with the mindset that you have to have the fundamentals of a strong team, unit economics. You can't be going in and saying, I'm going to become the next Uber in the next four or five years. I'm going to make a billion dollars in five years, uh, et cetera. They're going to have to be a lot more rational in being able to accept cash. And as valuations have dropped or at least stabilized at early stage, investors are more likely to take that risk for a $1 million check, a $2 million check at early stage than trying to fill a $50 million check at Series B. So yeah. I do think that first-time founders may find it easier relative to late-stage founders in this economic environment, but it's going to be a tough six to 12 months yeah. until we start seeing a real pickup of investment activity. But again, Q4 will be the litmus test and going to the events like Jitex and FII, you'll begin to feel the buzz and you do feel it very quickly. Are everyone singing from the same hymn sheet? Are they all depressed? Is there a lot of negative sentiment or are people beginning to be a bit more optimistic and look at the positives? And those which we've missed in that summer seasonality lull uh, and you haven't had that contact with clients and, and people, now you'll begin to feel it very quickly uh, when you're speaking to other founders and, and people from the region. Well, thank you for, uh, for that uh, great overview and analysis. Really, it's always great to talk to you. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Uh, and and we'll see what happens in January next year. Yes, it's going to be interesting to see what happens in Q4, as you said. Thank you. Thanks, Philip. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of Conversations with Lulu. I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to or watch the show to get the latest episodes. Do give us a rating and a review. It always helps in getting the show discovered. And don't forget to fill up the podcast listener survey. You can find the link to that in the show notes. It really helps me in getting to know you better. See you in a few weeks.